It is so good to be here with you this morning. My name is Jeremy Johnson. Uh, some of you may know me as JJ. I work with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at the University of Montana. And if you don't know what campus ministry is, we are missionaries. We're sent to the university. And in InterVarsity, we want to see students' lives transformed by Jesus, our campus renewed by Jesus, and students developed into world changers to work, to work alongside what Jesus is doing in the world. Campus ministry is more than just a fellowship. It is the front line of cultural and societal change. I came to Jesus in college. I played baseball in Texas, and I lived the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle. I was enslaved to the ways of the world, powerless to change, even though I had been raised in a Christian home and went to private Christian school my whole life. But through an InterVarsity Bible study in 2006, I encountered Jesus for the first time ever, I think. He spoke to me through his word. It took three years, but in my first semester of grad school in 2009, I surrendered. And the Lord made me alive in him. After that, I went to Kenya in 2011 with Brian and Debbie Lee, um, and God called me into ministry with InterVarsity. And in 2012, I moved up to Missoula, and I also forgot to mention I met my wife in Kenya. So <laughs> go to Kenya, go overseas for a mission trip, come back with a wife. It's not a bad deal. Um, God's ways are not my ways. <laughs> um, so I'm very thankful for InterVarsity and, and their call and what they do on campus. I'm also thankful for the, the staff um, that I work with, Brian and Debbie, Flynn and Casey. Thank you for leading this fall while I'm on sabbatical. Not everyone has a team you can trust in your absence for six months. So thank you guys for holding down the, probably riding the ship, actually. Uh, and thank the, the staff here um, at Mac. Thanks for letting me have a chance to speak. Um, it's an honor to be here in front of you and to help you lead, to, to lead you closer to Jesus. So where have we been? We have been in the book of Mark for almost a year as a church. And I love the book of Mark. InterVarsity actually studies it every year, and we break it down line by line, verse by verse. Mark is fast. It's moving. Um, the first half is really dealing with this big question, who do you say that I am? Who do we say that Jesus is? Even this morning, who is this man? The next half of the book really shows who his disciples are. They argue, who's the greatest? <laughs> it also reveals the fulfillment of Jesus as Messiah and Son of God. In the last couple of weeks, we've been in the last week of Jesus' earthly life. And last Sunday, we saw Peter's denial. Um, at this point in Mark, Peter has rebuked Jesus three times. He has fallen asleep three times and denied Jesus three times. That's not a good place to be. Praise God that he is merciful. Buona asafiwe. Praise God that he doesn't leave us in our failures. Buona asafiwe. In the last couple of weeks, um, oh, sorry, this morning, <laughs> Jesus is delivered to Pilate. We are in the shadow of the cross and the doorstep of death for Jesus. This has really been a difficult time for me to process, actually. We see Jesus coming into Jerusalem triumphantly, praised by everyone. He's the healer, the one who saw people, who helped people belong and made them feel loved. This is God's Messiah the Son and Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He has authority over demons, sickness, and the legalistic religious elite. We move quickly into the week and see the institution of the Last Supper, the Garden of Gethsemane, the betrayal, arrest, and the denial of Jesus last week. He is now all alone in front of men who are greedy for power, strength, and false honor. In preparation, I had to just kind of sit in this week had to sit in the, in the sin um, that is surrounding Jesus. He's betrayed, arrested, completely alone. It's hard to understand the depravity that we live in and operate in outside of being a new creation of Jesus. You know, and we don't really want to sit in it, do we? We don't want to understand the depravity and the brokenness of the world that we live in. Um, we see the King of kings and the Lord of lords as a lamb being led to the slaughter. The one who made me and you 
And the stars, the galaxies, the atmosphere, the mountains, the ecosystem, the the intricacies of our body, the one who replaced my heart of stone and gave me a heart of flesh. He gave me his spirit. He gave you his spirit. This Jesus is in the shadow of the cross this morning. And he is courageous. He is brave. He's obedient, loving, and kind in the face of mockings, beatings, and belittling. I actually fell in Jesus, fell in love with Jesus more this week as I recognized who he was again. Can we do that this morning? Recognize the beauty of Jesus. One of the first, there are a couple of verses that came to mind that, that I was thinking through, um, and one of them is Romans 5 8. Uh, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Um, and treasure seekers, if you're following along, that is your verse today. Um, or if you don't know, Treasure Seekers is a sheet created each week for the kids so they can follow along. You can pick them up in the, in the back of the worship center. A couple of more verses that kept rattling around. Romans 7, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 8, 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God, who, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He, he was flooding my heart and my spirit with who he is, this God that we serve. I follow Jesus because he is the only one worth following. And at the end of this morning, I hope you can see your need for his strength and power and surrender to his love more and move even closer to him. So if you, have your, if you have a Bible, you can turn it on or look in the, the seat backs here. We're on page um, 852, I believe. We're in Mark 15, verses 1 through 15. So Mark 15, verse 1. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things, and Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, He delivered him to be crucified. Would you guys pray with me? Lord Jesus, we we love you so much and thank you that you endured suffering at at the hands of envious men, of weak, truly powerless men. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are sovereign over the situation. We love you. Would you please speak through me and open our ears, make us good soil right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So the shadow of the cross. The religious leaders have made their final decision about Jesus overnight in verse 1 and have delivered him to Pilate. Pilate, who is this guy? He's the Roman prefect or governor of Judea. He's placed there to maintain peace in the Judean outpost, collect taxes, and render judgments. The Jews did not like him. That's one of the reasons why we see the custom to release a prisoner here. It helps to make Pilate look merciful and kind. 
to his subjects. We see the crowd, who is larger than normal because of the Passover feast. The religious elite, which is a term I'll use throughout this morning, is comprised of the chief priests, elders, scribes, and the whole council. And then Barabbas. His name actually means son of the father. Ironic, isn't it? And there are characters that we don't see or hear about in, in this little scene this morning. Obviously, the disciples and Peter aren't here, but what about the people that he healed? Where are they at? Where are the people that were welcomed by Jesus? You know, maybe they're far away in Galilee or they're not close to Jerusalem, but, you know, Jesus hung, didn't hang out with powerful people. <laughs> he didn't hang out with, with, the, with the elite they would have been shot down if they were there. Who are, the, who are you? You're just a, a nobody. Jesus hung out with nobodies. He's all alone right now. So what exactly is happening here? Uh, what I believe is the sin, we see some sin, uh, some key or core sins beginning to emerge through our characters. We have the religious elite delivering Jesus to be condemned because the Romans took the ability to legally put someone to death away from the Jews. So now only the Romans have the power of death. The religious elite have to get permission from him. That's why the term king of the Jews is used. It would cause Pilate to stop and consider if Jesus is a threat. Obviously, he isn't a threat. And why would the Jews want to kill him if he is against Rome? It's, it's all m mixed up. They were also waiting for the perfect time to make all this happen. It's early. Um, when all this is happening, and you know, where was the crowd when he was walking in? They had turned on him. Why? They chose Barabbas. Why? Because Jesus didn't fit their understanding, their distorted view of king. Barabbas was a murderer in the insurrection that had taken place recently. That's who they would have rather had, not a peaceful, loving, healing rabbi teacher. They would rather have violence and blood. Jesus didn't fit the picture of what their king does. Barabbas did. Then the religious elite who instigated the crowd, who probably helped the crowd see that Jesus didn't fit their picture of king, a king like David, a warrior king, were unbelievably jealous and envious of Jesus. Even Pilate recognized that in verse 10. They could not handle that Jesus is the Messiah who is suffering and breaking their laws and turning their understanding of the kingdom of God upside down. He is taking everything away from them. Their power, control, their identity. He is taking everything they have. And Pilate is a man who is there to keep peace. He represents Rome and is in this little obscure part of the Roman kingdom. If he can't control this area, how can he control something bigger and better? How will he climb the ladder, if you will? He's in a terrible predicament. He knows this man is innocent, but if he lets him go, he will be seen as weak and another insurrection may happen. He must satisfy the crowd. Within these three major characters, we see some core temptations, I believe. The sins that we see aren't very clear, and sins in general aren't as clear as we would like them, are they? They're typically convoluted. Um, that's why prayer is important. Amen? Prayer is important, and, and what I'm about to talk about isn't an exhaustive list of sins per se, but these are big areas where we are tempted to live out of. Um, the first core temptation I see emerge is, I am what I do. Okay, follow with me. The crowd fits in this. They don't understand who Jesus is. They want their Messiah and King to overthrow the Romans with violence and restore the power to Israel. They do not see the kingdom of God the way they should. So Jesus does not do what they want. So they choose Barabbas because he does and did. He murdered. He fights and murders to restore Israel. Barabbas is representative of the crowd. So what, is it, what does that mean for me? Though? What does it look like for us to be caught up in I am what I do? We believe that I will have honor. People uh, will be like, wow, look at what you do. Volunteering, helping others. I'm a lawyer, doctor, pastor, athlete. I'm a backpacker, I'm a skier, stay-at-home mom, engineer. We are tempted to be defined by what we do. None of those are bad, per se. But if that's my identity and what is, is trying to define me, that's not good. The second core temptation I see emerge is I am what I have. 
The religious elite fall into this. They have power. Even though they are under Roman rule, they have their sheep that listen to them, which you see in verse 11 where they stirred up the crowd. Jesus is threatening that, and the only way to stop him is by killing him. Jesus has had authority over them in teaching, over demons, over uh, sicknesses. He's even forgiving sins. He has proven that he has been sent by God. He's been taking away what's most precious to them, their power. And just an interesting note, Caiaphas, the high priest, he, he is actually the high priest for 19 years. The average of this era of high priest is about four. This man knows how to keep his power. So what about us? What is this, what is, uh, what is this look like for us? We're worried about not having enough power or control. We think if I had this much money in my savings or my bank account, then I would be okay. I would be safe. If I have the right car or house or clothes or friends, I would be satisfied. My identity is wrapped up in creating security in my life and not trusting God in his provision. The third core temptation that I see emerge here is I am what others think. Pilate (laughs) is very clear here. Pilate knows Jesus isn't guilty, but to satisfy the crowd, he gives up Jesus in verse 15. He is more concerned with how the crowd views him than the innocence of Jesus. If giving Jesus up means the crowd sees him favorably, then it is worth it, even if he gives up the king of kings. So what does it look like for us to operate out of I am what others think? We are paralyzed by views of others. If they don't like us, or don't like me, or approve of me, then I will become unraveled. My confidence and self-esteem is not who I am in God, but is actually given to me by others. I'm always trying to people please. But do you know who overcame these temptations? Jesus. He had the essence of these exact temptations. They just looked a little different. In Luke chapter 4, verse 3, the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Stone to bread. Do something, Jesus. Prove it. You're the Son of God. Prove it. Turn this stone into bread. I want to see it. You're a powerful miracle worker. Or the second temptation. Luke chapter 4, verse 5, And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. Worship me, and you can have all this. I am what I have. Jesus didn't need that, though, did he? Praise God. Third temptation of Jesus in verse 9. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Who is at the temple? People. If he throws himself off the top and people see him, Whoa, Jesus. Praise Jesus. Look at this guy. He's a... Again, a miracle worker. He's receiving praise for things that are not necessary. He doesn't need to people please. Jesus' identity was set before this. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. The devil knew that Jesus knew who he was. So he tried to tempt him to live out of it in a twisted way. It's not necessarily bad to care about what people think or what you have or what you do. But they can be twisted, and then we live twistedly out of them. Can you see what's happening here in our scene back in Mark 15? The ESV actually titles this, Jesus Delivered to Pilate. But in reality, it is the crowd, Barabbas, the religious elite, and Pilate being delivered by Jesus. Jesus, who is the spotless lamb being led to the slaughter like in Isaiah 53, is taking on their sin and my sin and your sin because he was the only one who could. He was taking the cross that was meant for Barabbas. This is a broken world. Only Jesus could save it. He overcame temptation. He knew who he was. He knew his mission. He had clear vision for what, the king, for what God's kingdom was. And as it reminds me, 
of the wineskins passage earlier in Mark. These guys were operating out of this old wineskin. Jesus is this new wine, and they could not receive him. They just couldn't. And he literally burst their wineskins. Let me remind you of who's on trial here. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Everything created was created through him, by him, and for him. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this. Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. Amen? Oh, Lord Jesus, forgive us of how we operate. And one more thing, we're all subject to these temptations. We're all subject to them. And for Pilate, I think they're actually all connected. Because satisfying the crowd leads to keeping what he does, his position, which allows him to keep what he has, his possessions. They all just kind of snowball. I think that's what saving your life looks like, actually. He was enslaved to these temptations, as were our other characters. Honestly, this is a sad scene. The, the, the sin on display, but the grace of Jesus in the middle of it. The religious elite, the crowd, and Pilate are the examples of how we can operate out of sin and not even know it. And potentially even think we're doing good. But I don't want to leave us here. I want to give us something to help us realign ourselves with God when, he, when we fall. Because we will. We're not perfect. Our aim is to be. But when we do fall, I, I want to give us something to, to walk away this morning with something we could use in this journey. It's meant to be a lifelong learning tool driven by the Holy Spirit and prayer as we are seeking Jesus. It's not, um, it's not about having a perfect formula or something. Uh, it's more about having a repent, repentant spirit day by day, even moment by moment, working towards God so that we don't fall into temptation and sin. Have you ever wondered why God does, uh, lets us go through difficult things? Or why would God let bad things happen to good people? <laughs> you know, God allowed his son to be crucified. There must be more to God than just fixing problems instantly or alleviating them before they begin. He allows us to go through this life, but he also has our best interest at heart, even if it doesn't look like it. A phrase to remember before we get into this, God does not work at the pace of divinity, but at the pace of humanity. He doesn't work at the pace of divinity, he works at the pace of humanity. He works at my pace, in your pace, he's patient with us in our transformation, in our sanctification. And there are a couple of principles of transformation that I want to start with. The first one is God is always present and at work in our lives. God does not slumber, and there isn't anything he does not know. It may feel as if he is gone or not present, but he is there. His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Example, think about the scene of Jesus before Pilate this morning. Where was God? Literally right in the middle of it. We may not see him all the time, but this is where we have faith in his love of us and his character. Principle number two, God cares about your sanctification, my sanctification, transformation, discipleship more than you do. He wants you to grow more into the image of his son and the unique gifts and talents he has given you. Example, Peter. In Jesus' last week of life, we see him deny Jesus three times, fall asleep three times, and earlier in Mark, he rebukes him three times. How terrible would it be to stay here? But if you know the story of Peter, Jesus reinstates him by asking him to feed his sheep and lambs. The failures he went through, Jesus used in making him ready to lead. Don't lose hope. Keep seeking Jesus. And some some key verses to help Again, work, get us in, a, in the right mindset. In Philippians 2, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Notice it says work out, not earn. We're not earning salvation. Jesus did that. But there is something about working out what's in here. It needs to get out. 
Are we doing that daily, believer? Are we working out our spiritual core, if you will? Or Colossians 3. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of of its creator. There's some serious language there, death and wrath. Paul is writing to the church. Are we, do we take it seriously, our sin? And then finally, Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's lay aside and put away anything that is hindering us from following Jesus better. We don't want to fall into those temptations like we saw this morning. I'm doing a lot of introduction because in our culture, slowing down and listening to the Lord is very hard. Even during our quiet times of the Lord, we find it hard to hear Him. Or is it just me? (laughs) Is it just me? Okay, good. I hear a couple laughs. Sometimes it's like God is not there. Maybe I'm just not focused on Him enough. We need to take seriously the deception of sin in us and our temptation to it. We need something that we can use that is powered by the Holy Spirit to help us realign ourselves with Jesus each day. Some of us do this more naturally, so the language I'm about to use will help you put words into something that may feel intuitive. You may already do this. And then for others of you, being reflective and introspective is terrible. You would rather pluck your eyeballs out than be still. But I'm begging you, take some time and reflect on what God is doing. So here we go. The whiteboard, I love whiteboards. Um, So, chronos is the word in Greek for chronological time. Kairos is moment in time, okay? So, chronological time, your life, kairos moment, a kairos moment, think of something big, like you get married or you have kids, something like that. That's a big kairos moment in your life. Not all kairos moments are that big. But to give you an example, so we're going to work around this circle. Um, I know it's kind of silly, but it helps me remember. Maybe you can remember this simple little diagram. The first word is detect. And honestly, detecting a kairos moment or God trying to break into your life is not always easy. Right? Like trying to be quiet, like you're just trying to do the next thing, but, but detecting what God is doing is very important. What is He doing in your life, even right now? What is He saying to you right now? After you've detected this, this God breaking in moment, dig. What is happening here? Uh, some words to think. The help this is being concrete. Is there a certain situation that you can connect to this this moment where God is breaking in? Be curious. Be compassionate even with yourself because it might get ugly if it's sin, right? The third thing is discern. Okay, why did I do that? Why did I do that or why didn't I do that? Why am I feeling like this, Jesus? Help me to understand, discern, What's happening in me? The fourth one is declare. And this is not a Michael Scott, I declare bankruptcy statement. (laughs) That's pretty empty. That is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this, Jesus. I'm going, I need your power. I'm not going to act like this. I'm not going to be like this. This is what I'm going to do. You declare it. And then... You do it. 
See how this kind of flows, hopefully? You can see the flow here. You detect what God is doing. You dig into what is happening. You discern why and what's going on. Declare, and you do something about it. Let me give you an example. So when I first took over the team leader role at the University of Montana, I began to have a lot of anxiety. And I don't know why exactly, I guess, but as I began to think about it, it wasn't because I was not confident. I I thought I could do the job. I thought I could lead. But this anxiety was tied to my ministry philosophy. What if it doesn't work? What if I don't do this well? What if the way that I'm leading and the, the, the decisions I'm making don't, I don't know, add up and we don't, I don't lead well. God used that anxiety for me to detect, like, you need to, you need to let me, like, I am in control here. So as I dug into it, I, I allowed, I recognized that I was trying to lead and not letting Jesus lead the ministry. Discerning why, because I think I wanted other people to see, I, I, I cared about what other people thought of me. So my, my identity was linked to my ministry philosophy working, therefore people would praise me. That's twisted. That's not right. Jesus is to be praised, not me. So I declared, I'm not going to do, I'm, Lord, I got to let that go. I, I'm, I will trust you. And what that literally looked like was in our staff meetings, letting other people make decisions or like not saying something. Okay, here's another example. This one's a little maybe sillier, but when I first became a Christian, I had this shirt that I thought made me look good, okay? (laughs) It's pretty embarrassing even saying it, but there was a shirt that when I wore it, I thought, wow, I look pretty good in this shirt, so I'm going to wear it. And God convicted me. Kairos moment, simple, is this shirt. Why are you wearing that? The, he's using this shirt to, to help me see I was operating out of this core temptation. I am what others think. So I discerned that, and then I declared, I'm not going to wear this shirt until I can, and I really haven't worn it very much since because um, I don't know if I can handle it. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's pretty bad, I know, but... But it's, but, but it's easy. It's easy to get wrapped up, right? And I'm not saying wear rags or something. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. But for me, God used that shirt to open my eyes to, to what I was really thinking and operating out of, okay? So what I want to do right now is I want to give you a minute. Maybe you, hopefully you wrote this down. What is God doing right now in your life, this service Can you detect anything? Is God breaking in right now? Or even this week, are you anxious? Are you withholding forgiveness? I want to give you just a a minute, literally a minute, and I want to invite the worship team to come back up, and we'll, we'll close. So go ahead and take a minute and do that. Worship team, you guys can come on up. God's sovereignty was on display this morning in front of Pilate. People weren't delivering Jesus to be crucified. They were delivered by Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus overcame temptation, and on the day that it looked as if Satan had defeated God, it was actually the day that our God revealed undeniable love, grace, mercy, and strength in the midst of 
twisted, sinful men. Who was on trial here? We were. We need to recognize our sin, but also do something about it. What is trying to define you today? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him, and he is worth following. So what do you need to do in order to follow him better? Maybe this morning the Holy Spirit is nudging your heart to come to him fully, not half-heartedly. Maybe those core temptations, you, that's me. I see it all over me. I'm operating out of that. Repent and come out of that. Lay it at Jesus' feet. Or maybe you've been hurt by the church in some way in the past, and that's certainly possible, but Jesus hasn't hurt you. He died for you. He faced worse injustice than any of us. Come to him. Or maybe you need to come to Jesus and surrender for the first time because you see what he did for you and who he is. That might be your Kairos moment this very day. Don't leave before talking to one of these pastors or staff. Uh, Today is the day of salvation. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. You are worthy of everything. You endured (sighs) false witnesses, betrayal, denial, evil men, and you took on their sin and my sin. Blessed be your name, Jesus, forever and ever. Amen.